So our next speaker is Mary Simmerling, who is an assistant professor of public health in the Division of Medical Ethics at Weill Cornell Medical College. Mary has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and her research concentrates on medical and research ethics, particularly on issues of justice, human rights, and organ transplantation. Today, Mary's going to talk to us about conflicting messages about conflicts of interest, reassessing current goals, and the strategies for achieving them. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, Mark, for inviting me and the McLean family. So, um, Jerry, thank you for making my talk seem not controversial at all. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that I don't have any financial conflicts of interest to report, um, except that I'm responsible for overseeing conflicts of interest at Cornell at the medical college, which could be seen as a conflict of interest of sorts. Um, I want to talk about four things. First, I'm going to go over some of the major changes in research funding and the increase in industry funding and decrease in federal funding, the widespread and what I think is increasing distrust in industry and in industry-funded research, review some of the calls for major reform that have come out in the last um, 10 or so years, and then invoke a concept related to one of my favorite Siegler papers, um, too much too soon, to ask the question, too little, too late, and uh, I think it's not too late yet. So first, some of the changes in research funding. You can see in this graph um, the funding trends from 1953 until 2005, and you'll notice that the arrow is the point in 1980 when the Bayh-Dole Act was passed. And look at the change in the funding. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Bayh-Dole Act, the Bayh-Dole Act um, not only allowed for, but put a mandate on NIH-funded researchers and institutions to commercialize the findings of their research because the NIH was funding all these studies, and because institutions couldn't commercialize the findings, nothing was happening with them. So you see a big change right there. And then if we look at the research spending growth from 2003 to 2008, we see the NIH has grown 7%, and pharma, biotech, and medical devices um, have become towers. I'm sorry that the years were cut off of this graph. This is from 93 until 2013, and you can see the um, success rates of funded, funded products at NIH. And here is a different, um, different view of this data, and this is actually the uh, total number of grants that have been funded. So clearly there's a big decrease in federal funding, and there continues to be an increase um, in, in industry funding. But there's also this widespread and uh, increasing distrust in industry and in industry-funded research and education. And it's not just from the public, it's also from physicians, physician trainees, and researchers. So the question is, does he who pays the piper call the tune? Let's look at some of the findings from studies on industry-funded research. Um, this study, which was published in 2003 in JAMA, found that 25% of all researchers have received pharmaceutical funding, 50% have received research-related gifts, and an analysis of the 789 articles from major journals found that 33% of the lead authors had financial interest related to their research. I would speculate that that number is probably higher now. Um, if you look at pharmaceutical industry sponsorship and research outcome and quality review, there was a, an article in 2003 in um, BMJ that showed that research funded by drug companies was more likely to have outcomes that favor the sponsor's product than research funded by other sources, and the difference could not be explained by the reported quality of the methods of the research. A psychiatry journal um, found, a study found that industry sponsorship and financial conflict of interest in the reporting of clinical trials, that um, those report, that reported conflict of interest were 4.9 times more likely to report positive <coughs> results, and the association was significant only among the subset of pharmaceutical funded studies. Um, another study uh, in New England Journal in 1998 found that authors um, supporting the use of calcium channel antagonists were significantly more likely than neutral or critical authors to have financial relationships with manufacturers and more likely than neutral or critical to have financial relationships with any pharmaceutical manufacturers. So these are really looking at the journals. There's been some really amazing research done recently by Aaron Kasselheim and his colleagues at Harvard um, on these topics. This study is a randomized study of how physicians interpret research funding disclosures. Um, it was published last year in September. And what they found is that physicians discriminate among trials of varying degrees of rigor, but industry sponsorship negatively influences their perception of the methodologic quality 
and reduces their willingness to believe in and act on the trial findings independent of the trial's quality. So let me remind you again that the direction our funding is going in is NIH funding is dropping, industry funding is rising, and our physicians don't believe in industry-funded research. What about trainees? <coughs> trainees' interactions with industry, I'm sorry, this is hard to read, and the column on the far right um, is research from 10 years ago that shows the shift in attitudes. Trainees' attitudes are also changing, and they are becoming more skeptical about industry-funded research and industry relationships um, in institutions. Um, this is another study uh, by some of uh, Castleheim's colleagues, uh, Eric Campbell, uh, which was published in February of this year, that showed receiving industry-sponsored food or beverages in the workplace and receiving free drug samples, both of which are common marketing practices of pharmaceutical companies, were associated with a greater likelihood of prescribing brand-name drugs, although no association was seen with industry-paid speaking or consulting, or with receiving industry gifts or reimbursement of travel expenses. Now, this is going to be important, and I'll talk about later on. The entire um, sh focus of the change in regulations recently was on um, consulting, not on, and on travel, not on tr um, gifts or, or uh, meals. Um, this is hard to read, but I'm sorry. This is a this is a um, Department of Justice report about the recent two point. Uh, no, this is the 409 million dollar settlement um, with uh, for marketing off label drugs. Uh, came out this year. This is another one that came out um, I think two weeks ago, and this is 2.2 billion um, that Johnson and Johnson just agreed to pay for uh, off label marketing of prescription of their prescription drugs. So amidst all this, it's not surprising that there have been a lot of calls for major reforms. I think that the calls for reforms have resulted in minor changes in regulations and practices that don't really get at the heart of what we need to be doing. This is a 2006 article, uh, or a quotation from um, Jerome Kaiser in the Boston Globe, and he said, disclosure is nothing more than an excuse to continue business as usual. Um, and he goes on to talk about physicians being bought. So this is 2006. Um, some of you may have been paying attention to Senator Grassley's focus on these areas. Um, we unfortunately received a letter from Senator Grassley um, asking about some of our um, researchers. And so he was focusing on how are the disclosures being made to institutions? What is the pharmaceutical company or what's pharmaceutical industry telling us about what they're paying these people? And what are the consent documents and research protocols saying? Um, there, was, there were a lot of big um, findings in this and uh, a lot of big researchers that lost their jobs and uh, were uh, on the front page of the New York Times. So um, Grassley also uh, wrote to the NIH and um, asked for an accounting of how they were uh, monitoring studies and what the results they had. Uh, the OIG got involved, um, they called for reforms, they came out and said that uh, we needed to, they need to increase federal oversight of grantee institutions to the NIH, um, provide details about the nature of conflicts of interest, how they're managed, reduced or eliminated, require institutes to forward conflicts of interest reports and receive grants from institutions that receive grants from um, the federal government. Then the AMA got involved. They put out a report about protecting patients, preserving integrity, and advancing health. Um, this was in January of 2008. They had some key recommendations also. They said that institutions should develop policies that cover financial conflicts of interest, use a compelling circumstances test, have annual reporting, um, address institutional COI, a number of things. I think the most important of which is to um, have a compelling circumstances test. I can talk a little bit more about that later. Then the Institute of Medicine came out. So you're seeing how over the last 10 years, this has just gotten focus from every single group. IOM said you've got to establish conflict of interest policies, create conflict of interest committees, prohibit faculty from accepting gifts, restrict visits from industry, and with certain exceptions, researchers should not be allowed to conduct research involving human subjects if they've got a financial interest in the outcome. Then, in 2011, the NIH or um, PHS published their um, final rule that we had to implement this by August of last year. The changes that they ended up coming out with were they changed the threshold level for disclosure from 10,000 to 5,000. Um, there was a new report requirement to report travel information that's reimbursed by any industry. A requirement that additional information is reported to NIH about natures of conflicts. Um, this one really uh, gave gave a lot of trouble to institutions, um, and it ended up 
not being much of anything so far, a requirement that we make accessible to the public information about conflicts of interest that NIH-funded researchers have. So we were all scrambling to get this in place and uh, ready for, for uh, I was ready for the New York Times, of course, to send me an email and say, tell us everything. Um, I was at a, dub, on a WMC conference call a couple weeks ago and at the meeting last year, and I think maybe a handful of institutions have received requests. I, we haven't gotten anything, so um, no one's asked about this yet. Um, and then there's a requirement for retrospective review if, um, if you don't uh, report the interests. Other federal changes that are coming, and we'll see if this changes um, how things are going. The Position Payment Sunshine Act comes out, uh, or is, is now in place this year. The information comes out next year. What this requires is for industry to report its payments to physicians, um, not, not non-MDs, to physicians. Um, and so that's another pot of information that's going to be available. This has not come out yet. However, um, ProPublica created several years ago the, the site Dollars for Docs, where um, a number of companies are already reporting what their payments are. Um, so this is searchable. Um, I think I just pulled up New York. They've got 30,206 30, disclosures for payments in New York. It's payments to institutions and to individuals. And they, they you know, to sort them by, was it research support? Was it travel? What were they being paid for? Uh, consulting, honorarium. So this is already available, but the other, uh, the other um, rule has not gone into effect. It's gone into effect, but we don't have the data yet. So. What the new regulations and the new rules and the push has been for transparency about financial conflicts of interest and to preserve the integrity of research. And I think that that's really important. However, disclosure about financial interests doesn't seem to me is sufficient to do the job we need to have done. And in fact, there's research that suggests that this strategy may have the opposite effect than what we intend. So there's a really great paper by um, George Lowenstein and colleagues called The Dirt on Coming Clean, The Perverse Effects of Disclosing Conflicts of Interest. And what they found is that conflicts, uh, are that um, disclosures um, actually sometimes undermine what we want them to do because people don't know what to do with the information. And I quote from the paper, the paradigmatic example of the person whose disclosure is unlikely to help is the medical patient who deals with only a small number of doctors, does so infrequently, lacks expertise in medicine, and enters the patient-doctor relationship trusting the doctor. So this is a really important finding. Um, Lowenstein quotes in his uh, paper uh, this uh, quotation from The New Yorker, where uh, we're talking about Wall Street, and um, being in New York now, uh, I, I'm close to Wall Street and understand it better. It has become a truism on Wall Street that conflicts of interest are unavoidable. In fact, most of them only seem so because avoiding them makes it harder to get rich. That's why full disclosure is suddenly so popular. It requires no substantive change. Transparency is well and good, but accuracy and objectivity are even better. Wall Street doesn't have to keep confusing, confessing its sins. It just has to stop committing them. So on the one hand, we've got this move towards disclosure, um, to either disclosure or just get rid of all financial interest altogether. And then uh, in February of this year, or, sorry, March of this year, this came out from the Office of Inspector General. Um, this is about physician-owned um, devices, or sorry, distributorships. And it, and it says very clearly, we do not believe the disclosure to a patient of a physician's financial interest in a uh, physician-owned distributorship is sufficient to address these concerns. So they either have to get rid of their relationship, um, or they, they have to get rid of the relationship. Disclosure in, itself, uh, in and of itself does not provide sufficient assurance against fraud and abuse because, and this is a very important line right here, and it really is consistent with what Lowenstein says, disclosure of interest is part of the testimonial. It's why people want to go there, because you think that the person is an expert, a reason why a patient should patronize that facility. Thus, often patients are not put on guard against potential conflicts of interest, the possible effect of financial considerations on the physician's medical judgment. So now I want to talk about where we are and whether um, it's too late or what we can do next. So also in um, earlier this year, in February of this year, this uh, article came out in JAMA, um, which has over the past decade published very many articles uh, uh, against uh, pharmaceutical companies and conflicts of interest. And this article had the very interesting title, Restoring Confidence in the Pharmaceutical Industry. And it's a great piece, and I recommend it to you. Um, one of the things that the authors say is, today, the world is a different place than it was in the past. 
and physicians in the public, at least for now, are skeptical about the credibility of industry-sponsored research. Taking critical steps to enhance trust and confidence in companies that sponsor clinical research should help enable the pharmaceutical industry to thrive and in doing so continue to provide important products that improve health. Because remember, again, NIH funding is going down, industry funding is going up, and we're getting more and more skeptical about whether we can believe it. So they make some great recommendations. They recommend four things. Data analysis should be performed by academic investigators who are not part of the company. Preparation of the manuscript reporting the study results should primarily be the responsibility of the academic investigators. Data from clinical trials should be made publicly available. And companies should refrain from direct-to-consumer advertising for some specified period of time after a drug is approved or until post-marketing studies are completed. So I endorse these recommendations, and I think we should add to them several more. Um, the IOM report in 2009 had a couple of additional recommendations I think it'd be uh, really uh, good to, to uh, include. And that is uh, that we should publish negative results from industry-sponsored clinical trials um, or, uh, or not delay the publication. Um, that substantial payments from pharmaceutical companies um, need to be disclosed. And that settlements should be disclosed um, for federal prosecutors and industry related to alleged illegal payments to physicians. As I just pointed out um, two weeks ago, the $2.2 billion settlement by Johnson & Johnson. So in conclusion, um, I think that we need to change how we do things. We need to make it meaningful and find ways to restore confidence um, that reflect that. And we should ask ourselves some difficult questions. Like, are our strategies working? Are we achieving our goals? And really importantly, do we have the right goals? We should re-examine the current gold standard practices and establish evidence-based strategies and principles-based frameworks for management and disclosure of relationships. We need to have more meaningful disclosures as part of the consent process, possibly even including dollar amounts, more information about relationships. And I think most importantly, to remain focused on why we're doing this, to advance research, to preserve objectivity and stand behind the research that we do produce, and to care for patients. Thank you very much. Sure, I, I'll, sure I'll take questions. Sure, Dan. So Mary, you, you gave great evidence showing that disclosure actually doesn't help and it actually may have a negative effect and then at the end you, you call for more better disclosure. Well, I think m more meaningful disclosure. So I, I don't think we should get rid of disclosure altogether. One of the things that the, the Lowenstein articles um, argued for is that when we do the disclosure, we do it now, and just say so-and-so has a consulting relationship with this company and it's embedded in a consent document with everything else, people don't know what to do with that information. So it's not that we have to put it in a consent form necessarily um, or, or have, uh, describe it the way we do now, but I think that it's, it's not impossible to make it meaningful, but I don't think the way we're doing it right now is meaningful, and I think it potentially has the opposite effect that we're trying to achieve. So yeah, thank you uh, for pointing that out. Yes, I think it's, it's a really important question. I would like to comment on your earlier um, statement, though, about um, physicians should derive income from their work. I think that um, I'm, I have come to see that some of this is part of their work. I mean, some of the work with industry is part of the meaningful work that's being done at research institutions. Um, it's certainly true at my institution. And so the idea that this is not the appropriate um, way for people to be um, earning money or working, I, I, don't, I don't know that I agree with that. I think it is part of their work. I think especially with the industry funding of trials, more and more um, there, there's a, there are real partnerships here. And that's why I think it's so important to work to preserve integrity and trust in industry partnerships because th there are a lot of them. And, and for a lot of our researchers, it is part of their work. I didn't mean the work that they're doing for industry. I okay. Yeah. Giving money for other things besides the work. No. Yeah. Right. Oh. Um, you had that fascinating slide where you showed that um, you know the, the the big things like consulting don't yes. have the impact, but the little things, the trinkets, the gifts, right. have the impact. I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit more. So um, I was surprised by that, and I, um, what, I've, what I've read in, in some articles suggests that people discount the influence that the small things have on them, but they um, distance themselves from the big things. And so if you're getting a, a big um, consulting fee or something, um, you may be more likely to feel like it could influence you, whereas you're not going to think that um, a slice of pizza at lunch is actually going to influence you. And so uh, they, they have the, 
the opposite effect on you. Um, I'm not a behavioral psychologist, um, but it seems like that that was what was talked about in the Lowenstein paper. And I think it's particularly disturbing that the regulations really focus on those big things and remain completely silent on the little things. And we're focusing all of our energy where it looks like we don't even need to be spending time. So thank you very much.